Hi there, and welcome to this webinar about the subject, Why Jesus Had to Die. My name's Mark Vincent, and I'm a member of the Christadelphian Church in Stirling in Scotland. And over the next 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to be exploring this, which I think to be one of the most uh, fascinating and deep questions that it's possible to ask. Why did Jesus die? Now, the life and the death of Jesus approximately 2,000 years ago are uh, widely recognized as a historical fact. It's recorded in the four Gospels in the New Testament in the Bible, and it's something that's also independently verified by ancient writers. So the, the life and death of Jesus are not in any uh, serious doubt. And in fact, it's recognized increasingly that the Gospel narratives themselves have this eyewitness testimony uh, to them. But the Bible also claims that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, the resurrection, shortly after his death. And it's interesting that there's also a very strong historical case that can be made for that, although uh, that's not something that we're going to have time to, to, to get into today. Let's just uh, take a, a, a moment or two to think a little more about uh, the, the crucifixion. So we're not going to go into the details of what exactly crucifixion involved and you know the, the, the process and the agonizing details of it and the physiological effects of crucifixion um it's it, it's harrowing reading actually it's quite sickening to read about that and but it's something that you can easily uh, look at through a google search and, and so forth um but just to make that point that crucifixion was actually developed as a method of killing people in order to maximize uh, cruelty, uh, shame, and pain. That was its purpose. And so if you take the English word excruciating, what that word literally means is out of the cross. When something is excruciating, we're comparing it to uh, a crucifixion because that was so notable as a, 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 a the most painful way to die. And even in Harry Potter, it even made it there. In fact, as Crucio is, of course, one of the curses in Harry Potter. And again, you can hear that link with the word crucifixion there. So, so Jesus' death was agonizing. It really was a, a passion, a, a, an absolutely appalling way for anyone to meet their end. Uh, never mind this being uh, the, the Messiah, uh, the, the, the Son of God. And so what are we to make of that event? Was it a, you know, a random historical event? There's all kinds of, of, of strange things that have happened in history. Was this just another one of, of those? Or is it something uh, deeper than that? Well, um, although Britain itself may sometimes be described as a post-Christian nation, if we think about it on a global scale, there are approximately 2.8 billion uh, Christians who, of course, uh, to some degree or other, you know, this is the foundation and, and course it's absolutely right that it is the foundation it's the central moment it's the central part of faith the central moment of human history in fact it's the great pivot of human history uh, according to the bible and according to the gospel message so so what does it mean why did uh, jesus die and what did his death do to help so our plan uh, in the session that we've got ahead of us is to um, look at a Bible passage to introduce that for us, to talk a little bit about sin and what that's all about, and then in the, in, in the majority of the session to explore the crucifixion as this dramatic historical event that took place, to think about the various participants who were there, uh, the human beings, the men who crucified him, Jesus himself, to think about God as Jesus' Father, and to think about ourselves as observers and witnesses of these events, and to think about what the crucifixion meant, meant and means from all of those perspectives, because I think that will help us understand uh, why it was that Jesus died and why his death is of such a central significance. So that's the plan, and let's begin with a passage uh, of the Bible from the Apostle Paul. This is 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 3 and 4. This is, in fact, one of the earliest writings that we have in the world, actually, never mind in the Bible, um, about uh, the death of Jesus and his resurrection. And I'm going to be reading this from the 
uh, English Standard Version, the ESV. So the passage says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So this is Paul introducing the gospel message, and he sees the death and the resurrection of Jesus as being absolutely central to what the gospel message is. This is the first thing that he talks about. And he says that I delivered to you as of first importance. So this isn't some sort of optional aspect of the gospel, you know, that you can, well, you know, think about it if you would like to. Uh, this, is, this is fundamental to what the gospel is and to understanding it. So that was the first point there, and this is really important. It's of first importance, as Paul puts it. Um, the second point is uh, Paul says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So Christ's death was not then some kind of accident. It wasn't a random event of history. It was something that happened in accordance with the scriptures. And now the scriptures for Paul were what we would call today the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Um, so God had already said before, hundreds of years before, in fact, that these things would happen. It was in some sense part of his plan um, that this would happen and that it would bring a solution to uh, the human problem. So, so, so this was all then part of a, 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 an organized and structured and intended uh, purpose of God. So Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So, you know, to make it absolutely clear so we really don't miss the point, Paul hammers that home twice there, that Jesus died according to the scriptures and he was raised according to the scriptures. This was no accident. Um, the Bible and God always expected that this would happen. But why did it happen? Well, the passage tells us that as well. It says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So, so, so there's the purpose then. The purpose of it was for our sins, to help us with the problem of our sins. So that then raises another question, doesn't it? And takes us to the second part of our session, where we need to think for a few minutes about what sins are, what sin means, why it's a problem, and why Christ's death was needed to address that problem. Sin is, uh, it's not a common word, is it, in everyday language? What is it about? Well, you can notice that in the middle of it, it's got the letter I, and it, it is essentially about putting ourselves, putting my interests before uh, what God wants and before what might be in the interests of other people and it is still and it will always be while human beings are around a matter of central importance and I want to illustrate that the relevance of this idea of sin I want to illustrate the relevance of it but through through three statistics so the first one is 250 million that is the number of people who were killed in the 20th century by their own governments. I think that's an astonishing number and it is devastating. So this includes all those who were killed by their own governments in the atheist states and communist regimes like China and Russia, you know, and the Stalin and so forth. But it, but, but it covers a whole mass of countries, in fact, including some Western ones. And um, so, so instead of people, these 250 million people, and just think how many people that is. You know, if you were to go through the, the smaller countries of Europe, how many countries you would have to completely wipe out to take out 250 million people. It's an absolutely uh, enormous number. Um, instead of being able to look to their government for protection uh, and support, their governments killed them. And that number is on top of, it's additional to all the people who died through wars, uh, civil wars and international uh, conflict in the last uh, century. So that yes, there is a problem. The second statistic is one in three or 35%. That is the number of women, according to the WHO, who 
have suffered either physical or sexual abuse at some point during their lifetimes. Again, it's just a horrible statistic, isn't it? And it tells us something, you know, human beings are, are capable of wonderful things, artistic creativity, intellectual pursuits, um, all kinds of stuff, acts of amazing self-sacrifice and generosity, all of that good stuff. And yet there is this other thing going on uh, in human beings, within human nature, that allows things like this to be. And our third statistic is another one, and this is the number one billion. That's the number of children between the ages of two and 17, again, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, who have suffered physical, uh, sexual, um, uh, or emotional violence or neglect in just the past year. One billion children. So, you know, anyone who claims there's not a problem here is just deluding themselves. There is a massive problem with human nature. And what we need to understand is why are we like this? How, how, how come that we can do this to ourselves, to each other? How come power can be so dangerous and it can be wielded at the expense of um, other people uh, and, and to cause such harm? And it, it's important, you know, not to think about this as just being a problem out there. You know, this is something that some other group of people have done, you know, the, the environmental crisis that we're in, you know, the, well, that was caused by, you know, institutional evil or big business or corporate greed or corruption, or, you know, we think about miscarriage of justice that happens in, in the various justice systems around the world and, and so forth. Or that we think, you know, there are those bad people who do that. So, you know, there are rapists and, 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 and it, it's sort of other people but that we actually make the connection that there is something with all of, within all of us. So, you know, there the may be uh, things that, uh, and, and, you know, there are all kinds of things that we as individuals have not done, uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we're perfect or that everything's great with us. Because I think when we look inside ourselves, we can recognize that there is within each of us the, the, latent potential which and it actually comes out much more often than we would like to be greedy uh, to be selfish to put our interests before other people and it's like uh, it, it, it's like there's a, a template there's a target of what we would like to be what we would hope to be our better self of what we're aiming for and yet somehow we disappoint ourselves and we disappoint other people and there are moments where we are cruel to other people where we get satisfaction from uh, their failure when we push them out of the way to get what it is that we want and these you know these things just well up within us and we are less than we know we should be and that we ought to be so this isn't just a problem that we can point the finger at other people or at other systems and say but I'm okay this is something that affects us all. It's a fundamental fact about human nature and it's something that needs to be addressed. So how can it be addressed? How can we be saved uh, from this? And the answer to that then, according to Paul, this is the passage we looked at in Corinthians, is that we can be saved from this through the death of Jesus, but uh, how and why? How does the death of Jesus help us? Let's move on then now to consider that, to think about the crucifixion of Jesus, his death upon the cross, and what that means from the perspective of the various people who are involved. And we want to see those events as being, in a way, a message from God, that God is telling us something by this thing that happened. And we'll just quickly look at another passage from the Bible at this point. Uh, this is Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> again, uh, the Apostle Paul, and verses 19 to 26. Now, I'm not going to read this passage out, and it's quite a complicated passage, and you might want to look at it in your own time. Um, but, but I just want to just pull uh, three phrases out from it that, that make this point. And then the first one, Paul says this, now, the righteousness of God has been made manifest. So God has shown or 
um, or made manifest, made clear his righteousness somehow through the events of the crucifixion. Now, how? That's what we're going to think about. Um, and, and righteousness, I know that's another word, a bit like the word sin. That's not a very common word nowadays, but you can really think of it sort of as the opposite of sin. Righteousness is about doing what is right, about what God has said, uh, uh, going the right way rather than our own selfish way. And in some way, then, the crucifixion will show us what the right way is. The second phrase from Romans 3 is that God has put forward Jesus on the cross for us to uh, behold. And the word that he uses there when he says God has put him forward, Paul was originally writing in Greek. And the word is the word placarded, you know, a placard, like a big billboard that you might drive past in your car that says, you know, buy this toothpaste or whatever it might be. The reason why you have billboards is, of course, so that people see them and, and take notice of what it is that you're advertising. And so in the cross, God is proclaiming something. He is putting something like holding Christ up on a billboard for us to look at and for us to consider. Um, and in the third phrase in Romans 3, this was to show or to declare God's righteousness. So we'll want to ask ourselves, what is the message that God is communicating to us in the events of Jesus' death? And how does this show um, that God is righteous? So let's get into uh, the, the, the meat of it now when we actually think about the events of the crucifixion. And we're going to start off by thinking about what human beings did, what the men did who uh, were there at Jesus' death. Jesus died on the cross because people chose to kill him. People requested uh, that he be put to death. And it was two groups of people. You had the Jews and you had the Romans. And, and the Romans, in a way, stand for the Gentiles. All the rest of us who were not Jewish, uh, you've, got, you've got all of them uh, there, Jews and Gentiles. And what you've got, another way of thinking about that is that you've got religious power represented in the Jews, the Jewish leaders, who asked Jesus to be killed. And you've got the political power, the Roman leaders, who actually executed, uh, who carried out the crucifixion. So institutional power then is being condemned here in this, uh, that the, the, the human power structures of the world were not able to stand up for a righteous man who said things that no one else had said. He was too different. He was too radical. They could not take it. And all they could do was to silence or to attempt to silence uh, the message that he came to bring. We can break it down further than that. We can step down another layer because, uh, you know, within the Jewish community, there were two groups. There were the leaders and there was the common people. And within the, the Romans, again, there were two groups. There was the leader, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor at the time. And there were the soldiers who actually carried out the orders. And we can think through each of those also. And by doing so, we can see aspects of human nature and motivation that are very powerful. So why did the Jewish leaders want to kill Jesus? Well, in a word, they did it because they were jealous of him. Up to this point, they had been the top dog. They had been the ones who were respected, the ones who people turned to for advice and for guidance. Um, and, and, and now Jesus had come along and he was, he was better than they were. And they recognized it. His, his personal life and example were better. His words and his message was more powerful. Uh, he was more right in what he said. And they just couldn't take that. They just resented it. And it just boiled up and built up inside of them until at last uh, it led them to demand his crucifixion. So this is power corrupted, isn't it? unable to recognize that there is something right and good and better here, but rather wanting to keep the power uh, for yourself. And what about the common people? Well, they were gullible. They were easily led. They allowed themselves to be manipulated by the leaders, and they went from one moment loving Jesus and wanting to hear him and flocking to him to the next minute wanting him to be crucified. Uh, so fickle in their affections. So one minute going one direction, the next minute changing when the wind changed going in another direction. Again, isn't there something there about human nature that no one was prepared to stand up and say, no, this should not happen. This is not right. 
nobody did. When we turn to the Romans, um, again, we've got Pontius Pilate there, so he's the Roman governor, and he recognizes, this is so ironic, he recognizes that Jesus is innocent, that he's done nothing worthy of death, and yet he kills him anyway, which is just bizarre, and yet these are the sorts of things that can happen uh, where human nature is involved. He allows himself to be manipulated by uh, the Jewish leaders, and he's afraid that he will lose his job. I remember a, a meeting that I, that I, that I had, a, a group meeting a few months back with uh, the chap who used to be uh, Theresa May's uh, former chief of staff when she was prime minister, and he said, one of the things that you learn very quickly uh, is that when someone becomes prime minister, anyone becomes prime minister, they don't want to give up being prime minister. And, and again, something about human nature there, that we want to hold on to whatever power that it is uh, that we may have. And that was Pilate's uh, problem. And he became a victim of his, you know, he looked like the most powerful man who there was at the time, but actually he allows himself to be boxed into the corner and he's not prepared to stand up and do the right thing uh, because he doesn't want to lose his job. And then there are the Roman soldiers. What about them? Well, at one level, they can excuse themselves, can't they? They can say, well, I'm just following orders. I'm just doing my job. Well, haven't we heard that before? You know, when we think about some of the atrocities that were committed in, 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 in uh, you know, at the, in Europe at the time of the, at the, time of the war and so forth. Um, that's no excuse, is it? Uh, well, it's an excuse, but is it good enough? Is it good enough to say, I was just following orders when we know that the orders are to do something which is fundamentally wrong? And there's something else there in them as well. There's the, about the gang spirit, about what it is in human nature, this sort of animalistic thing that gets satisfaction in being cruel to other people and, 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 and enjoying their humiliation at some level. And there's a, there's a phrase in Shakespeare where Prospero, I think it is, says, and yet I find it in my heart to beat him. And so there's this, you know, there's this guy, this victim, um, this character, and, and he recognizes in himself, there is just this impulse to be cruel, to stick the boot in uh, and, and to get satisfaction at some level from wielding this power and humiliating another person. What, what is there? What, what is that in, within us? that makes us uh, behave like that. And so when we think about those different characters, what we can see is human nature is being exposed for us and we are seeing what it is when, we, when it goes wrong. We are seeing what there is within us that is a problem and that needs to be fixed. We see sin writ large uh, before us, as it were, on a billboard. This is what sin is. This is what sin does if it is not checked. This is where it leads to. It leads to the death of the very person that God had sent uh, to be uh, the savior of the world. And again, I think it's, uh, it's deeply ironic that in scourging him and mocking him and crucifying him, crucifying him, they had sought to bring shame upon him. This was the most shameful way of treating a person, another human being. They'd sought to shame him, they'd sought to expose him, and there he is on the cross, possibly, probably naked. Um, and yet, in doing so, they were only exposing themselves and what was, what, what was and is wrong uh, with human nature. And this is brought home to me in the, one of the phrases that Jesus uses to describe himself. He, when, he, when he refers to himself, he often calls himself the son of man. So he identifies himself with us um, as our brother in some, in, in some ways and as, as, as a son, as a son of human beings. And we take him and we kill him. And so there's this sort of grotesque thing of, you know, of, of almost child sacrifice here when the people um, murder Jesus in this way. And of course, another title of Jesus is the son of God. You know, how um, flagrant a sin is it that we should take the Son of God and do this uh, to him? So the crucifixion then shows us uh, what we like. It's like. It's like holding a mirror up to us so that we can see our bad side, what is wrong, and what and that and that's something that need you know, that something needs to happen about it. And I wanted to bring that out just by re reading a couple of lyrics actually. So it was 
this is uh, this is from a, a U2 and BB King song from back in the late eighties um, called "When Love Comes to Town," and they're just bringing out that point that this is not about saying, "Look at what the Jews Jews did, look at what the Romans did, how terrible I would never have done that." Rather, it's about the opposite. It's about saying, "If I look within myself deeply enough, I can see within myself." the the seeds of this i can see how this could have arisen and how i could be implicated in it and i need help because of that i was there when they crucified my lord i held the scabbard when the soldier drew his sword i threw the dice when they pierced his side but i've seen love conquer the great divide so this is my uh, responsibility and involvement in it but it's also that on the other side, there is this love coming from Jesus and from God, which conquers that divide, which we'll come to in a second. And this is another one. This is, uh, th these are the, the words from a hymn called How Deep the Father's Love to Us. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So if the death of Jesus exposes human nature and all its evils and flaws, what Jesus did in giving his life and accepting uh, this fate exposes the opposite. We see him lifted high upon a cross as our perfect example what was unique about jesus was not just the unique message that he brought the things that he said it was also the way that he lived the perfect and sinless life that he never gave in to those inner voices looking to put himself before others or before god so so we see his perfect example we see him giving where it would be our instinct uh, to to take and giving even his own life. And, and that's a complete paradigm shift, isn't it? It's so natural for us to escalate. You know, you do this to me, I'll do this to you. And then the first person retaliates by doing something worse and escalating and escalating it goes. And even in the first family in the Bible, you've got this escalation until at last Cain murders his brother Abel. That's the first family. And already there's murder within it. That's the problem. And Jesus does the exact opposite. If there was anyone who had the power to save himself and uh, to not suffer this to happen to him, it was him. And yet he chose to accept it and to give his life rather than take power to defend himself. So that's the paradigm shift then. That's the upending of the traditional human way of behaving. So you've got this aspect of surrender then in what Jesus does of surrendering to what they did to him. Yes, um, of, you know, the, the normal thing being fight or flight and him choosing to do neither of those things, but instead to surrender to God and to trust in God to save him. And in fact, Jesus' last words from the cross, uh, some of his very last words were to say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So that's the very opposite of trusting in myself and my own resourcefulness and saying, I lay it down. Whatever power I have, I lay it down and I'm going to trust in God to, to save me from this situation. And um, that's what Jesus did. And God did indeed save him. And that's the story of the resurrection uh, for, for a moment or two's time. So Jesus also surrenders the life that he had then in order to receive a new life. So, so he's got this nature like us, which is subject to temptation. You know, that choice of, do I do my own thing, the selfish thing, or do I do God's thing, or something that helps other people? He, he's got that tension within him, and he fights against it, and he fights against it, and he wins all the time. But that's his nature, and ultimately, that's a, you know, it's a corruptible nature, and, and ultimately, it's a dying nature. And Jesus says, there's no future in that existence, in that nature. And so he surrenders his life in order that God should give him a better life and a better existence um, when he raises him from the dead. And then we need to think about sacrifice for, for a few moments when we think about what Jesus did. Now, 
we've got a great example of what sacrifice is at the moment when we think about you know lockdown and people going outside and clapping for care workers and the NHS. Why are we doing that? Why are we recognizing uh, what they're doing? Because they're putting themselves at risk. They're, put, they're doing things that the rest of us are not doing. They're, they're making a sacrifice. They're taking something on. And, and we applaud them for that. And when you think about most of the worthwhile things that humans achieve, we achieve it by giving up something else. We give up something in order for something greater. And Jesus, of course, makes the ultimate sacrifice by giving up his own life. And he receives a better life from God, as we've just uh, said. But also the result of Jesus surrendering his life, of laying down his life, is so that we could be saved from our sins. The Bible uses a number of pictures to describe that, but one of them is like paying a ransom or paying a debt. It's like because of our sinfulness, we all deserve to die. That's a price that has to be paid. And uh, Jesus gives up his life and pays with his own blood um, as our representative so that our sins can be forgiven. He takes our sins. It's like he shoulders the burdens of our sins. He takes our sins on himself which he can do because he doesn't have any sins of his own. He takes our sins on himself and then he puts them to death. He crucifies them, literally, and they're gone, they're killed, they're dead, they're never coming back. That's what happens to our sins. That's the sacrifice that Jesus made and it's an incredible thing. And so that brings us then to our last couple of sections where we think briefly about what God did and then about our own role in all of this. So we've thought about Jesus' sacrifice as the greatest gift that he could give. God also did the same. God himself, of course, cannot die. But what God does is to give his precious only son, his only begotten son. And for those of us who are parents, you know, we can probably relate at least to some degree with the feeling that, you know, there wouldn't be anything worse than seeing our children suffer. And we may feel that we would rather suffer our, that ourselves than to see their pain. And so God gives this most precious gift. And in fact, one of the most famous verses in the whole Bible is from John 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should, um, uh, should have everlasting life and should not perish. So G God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, knowing that we would do this to him, knowing that human beings would crucify him, God still gave him. Uh, that's absolutely incredible. And I think words, you know, words fail to, to express that. Now, what God also does, and this comes back to the billboard, you know, the placard again, what God also does is he condemns sin. Because we see sin for what it is. We see what sin is like. We see what it does. We see how terrible it is. And we see that it's wrong. And we see that God is right. To condemn it. So there's this aspect here of the crucifixion condemning sin, saying anything that is not going God's way is the wrong way, and there is no future in it, and it has to be uh, put to death. And we won't look at this now, but that passage from Romans that we talked about earlier, Romans 3 19 to 26, if you look through that passage, difficult passage, but, but you'll find the seven expressions there that talks about the way in which Jesus sacrificed shows or declares or makes clear the righteousness of God, that God is right in what he says about sin, that sin really is bad, and that's why 250 million people died from uh, the, the democide, and that's why the abuse happens, and that's why sometimes I you know, don't behave as I would like to behave um, you know, to people that I come into contact with, and jealousies and whatever else. Um, that's what, th that those things are indeed wrong, as God said, and that's something had to be done about and that Jesus took those things on himself and uh, that he died uh, on the cross as a sacrifice. Um, so we see both what's wrong with sin and we see what's right in going God's way. And we see that perfectly in the perfect life that Jesus lived. So then let's uh, wrap things up by thinking about ourselves and what all this means for us and what, uh, you know, what we must do. And the first thing that we must do, I think, is to own it to take responsibility, to not look for someone else to blame, you know, whether it's some psychological factor or sociological factor or the way I was brought up or, you know, that person made me do it. None of that, that we actually own up 
to our own responsibility for the things that we do that are wrong, that we don't seek to defend ourselves, but rather that we turn to God for forgiveness uh, for sins, which is available to us freely as God's gift uh, because of what uh, Jesus did. That we cast our burdens and our sins upon the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and that we accept the forgiveness that is on offer. And that we try to make that paradigm shift in our lives, that we do the same overturning of things that Jesus did, that we give rather than take, that we surrender to God's control rather than thinking that we can do everything ourselves. Jesus' death was not the end. God raised him from the dead and his death actually became the gateway to a new life. And we can see that pattern of death as the door to something better. We can see that actually built into the very structure of nature itself. So every night comes to an end and the sun rises and a new day is born without fail. The two things belong together. The winter comes and the plants die back and the animals, some of them go into hibernation. But with the spring, uh, it's like the world comes to life again. It, it is like a resurrection out of death and life begins and the flowers bud and bloom and so forth. Uh, so, so, so this very pattern is built into nature. And uh, in Jesus' death, Paul made that point in uh, Corinthians in the passage that we began. Jesus, Jesus died, but he rose again. They both happened according to the scriptures. And so in Jesus' resurrection lies our hope. Hope for a life now, a life, uh, a, a new life in Christ, um, but hope for an even better life to come when the Lord Jesus Christ returns.